Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So today is another fireside chat, but today, sadly, not with Inga. Um, Inga can't make it today, so I'm hosting in place of Inga. Um, and I will just share some of our camp updates before John takes the floor, introduces the session, and then Gareth and Conan from Camp Siotra Cree in Ireland, who are the guests, the camp, the camp guests today, will be sharing everything about what they're up to. Um, Gareth, would you be able to share the screen from now after all? Yeah. Great, thank you. Hey. So I work for you, Kat, or Faith? Yeah, that's great. And you can also, if you click present in the right hand corner, it makes it full screen as well. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, Camp Experiences Festival, just to share some. Um, important news from ERC. You can go to the next uh, two slides along, Gareth. <laughs> then the next one along. Yeah. So we have three uh, camp experiences coming up. We have one in uh, just over a week. That will be at Camp Embercombe, which is based in the UK. And it will be an edible wilderness um, course uh, for the autumn season at the rewilding camp. So Camp Embercombe is particularly focused on rewilding. Um, Altiplano will be running one just straight after that. Camp Altiplano is based in Spain and they'll be doing a general introduction into ecosystem restoration. And finally, Camp Habiba are continuing their community experience, um, camp experience. And that's an ongoing um, camp experience, you can register for all of these through the ERC, the Ecosystem Restoration Camps website. If you click on the tab for events, uh, you can see the details of the events and click to register there. Next slide is, thank you Gareth. <laughs> the next slide, so this, um, here's some news about ERC. So Camp Regenesis have just finished their, their latest camp, um, which is called Bamboo Origins. And they had 28 campers, and many of them have just returned from, from, a, from this camp, with this time together with friends, they brought along friends, and they planted um, a, range, a diverse range of economically and ecologically valuable bamboo species. And they also gathered around the campfire and listened to indigenous stories with music from rare bamboo instruments. They've also, next to their camp experience, been uh, expanding their bamboo nursery into a commercial operation um, and they're preparing their first food forestry zone at the moment so watch this space, I'm really curious to see what comes next. Um, at Camp Hotlam, they have been visited by the California <clears throat> State Department because following the wildfires, um, the, the ground has been intoxicated. And so they're working uh, with the State, the State Department and they will be removing, <clears throat> removing those toxins over the next weeks. They've also submitted a plan to get a grant in order to replant the 15 acres and plant 4,500 trees. So let's keep our fingers crossed that their grant is successful and that they receive the funding to do so. Camp Green Pop in South Africa has just finished up their Eden Festival, the Eden Festival of Action, and that's involved planting trees of pioneer species along with film screenings, biomimicry workshops and loads more. Um, if you can ever, if you're based close to South Africa um, or planning to be in the area, I really recommend going to one of their camp experiences. And finally, Camp Roccia Viva, uh, based in Italy, is gathering their forces to start. So they will have full, a full four days gathering with the local community um, to design the entire project. And they will be working together with the local owner of the land to do so. 
exciting news. Okay, that's the news at ERC. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John for your news and an introduction to, to today's session. Well, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. So I am today in Valencia. I'm traveling internationally for the first time during this COVID pandemic. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I've just learned how to do this. If I could share my screen, I wouldn't mind showing you something. Let me see if I can do that. But I have to find it first. Oh dear, I'm so slow. But let me see. Good grief, why am I so slow? Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to show you. I'll put it, I'll put it into the chat or put, it, put a link in for you. Um, I just visited my granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter. So she's quite lovely, Leilani, which I'm told means sacred flower in Hawaiian. And she's four months old, and I didn't get over there to see her until now. So how exciting. And I'm here, I'm meeting with uh, Professor Mian Mian, who is a very well-known meteorologist uh, here, and uh, also Thies van der Hoeven from The Weather Makers, and we're discussing restoration here in uh, in Valencia, and also the project in the Sinai Peninsula. If you don't know about that, you can look up the Holy Grail of Restoration, um, where a very large area in, in Egypt is being prepared for large-scale restoration. But it's today, it's all about Ireland, and how exciting is that? So. Um, I can't wait to learn more about this, and I'm so glad that uh, all of you have come, and I will stay on as long as required to, um, to talk afterwards. But uh, back to Faye. Thank you so much. Yeah, so as, as usual, we'll have a presentation from, well, this time from Camp Silcher Tree. And then we will have a Q&A session. And uh, after that, we can keep the chat open and keep chatting with each other um, going forth after six o'clock if you choose to stay. Um, so a little introduction to Camp Silcher Cree. And I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm still not saying it right. Oh, Sh Shilter Cree. Shilter Cree. Shilter is seed and Cree is heart in Irish. And we're really lucky to have Conan here today because Conan has been, well, chasing lambs. Is that right? Or, or what's yeah, happened? Yeah. Um, the lambs had, we had them all eventually in the trailer and ready to set off back home with the lambs. And one of them had just jumped across and ended up having to chase him around the mountain for maybe 40 minutes and then got mixed up with other sheep, got him back into the, the car. I got to this side of where we let them out. And of course, the one field I wanted them to go to is not where they wanted to go. And I'm, I'm here. I made it on time, but slightly <laughs> stressed and edgy. But yeah, a good stereotype of Ireland. <laughs> Sheep farmer. <laughs> yeah. Put in nettle stings and with nettle like stings socks. And yeah. water. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank Good you fun. both for being here. And. Um, just a brief, a really brief introduction then, while, while Gareth, if you want to have, get your screen share. Mm -hmm. um, so Silcher Cree, um, Shilter Cree, is based in <laughs> Ireland, and their, their mission is to restore islands, ecosystems, and communities. And they're doing this through three pillars. So the first is education, focused on regenerative cultures. The second is on exploring resilient and regenerative food systems. 
And the third is carrying out ecosystem restoration work, getting stung by nettles, chasing off the lambs, and more details that we will hear about now. So do you want to take it away? Yeah, cool. Just to mention too that we've got also Karen and Lily here as well. Um, they're deeply involved in it too, so they're in the back, they're supporting it here as well too, so, and yeah. So thanks very much for having us, John and Faye and Kat and Ecosystem Restoration Camp. It's really a pleasure and everybody for coming. So yeah, we're, so Shield Decree, we're seeds of the heart. It means, um, yeah, seeds of the heart. So I'm going to shoot, go back to this. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So yeah, we're based here in Ireland. You can see the capital city there marked in red and where the other red dot sort of halfway north, northeast of the country. So slightly on the drier side of the island, but we still get plenty of rain and it's still really green. Um, lots of water all the time and um, a good, healthy uh, dose of water. Like it's, it's very, what's the word? Drumlands is the word for the um, land form we have around here. So small hills. And I think if we move on to the next slide, we have a, well, that's actually that's the camp um, in the red. The so yeah, the black outline was the land that was originally up for sale, and the the neighbouring farmer bought the rest of the land in the black, and then this the land in the red outline there was the, the basis for Camp Shield Degree. Um, I think the next slide shows it's three three acres, or like that's like half a hectare, so it's quite a small scale, but. Um, so that of oh, yeah. the, the exact land, but it's yeah, that's that's it then from uh, zoomed in perspective. Um, so you can see over the the field at the back there, and then there's the the hay shed, and there's a dwelling house then. That's where we are now, and more more sheds. Um, so we we'll, we'll go into that further in a while, um, but we'll just show you what's around and around around and about the, the site. Um, lots of industrial agriculture. Um, basically, it's dairy, beef, some sheep. Um, but all of these um, fields have been cleared over the last... Um, well, we were supposed that Ireland was colonised back in the... over, the, over maybe eight, four, 800 years ago. And the British Navy... They um, used sort of the woods of Ireland to explore the rest of the world. There's other reasons as well for land clearances and lots of other social um, things going on. But this is what we've ended up with today. So sort of large fields for dairy cattle, mostly um, sheep. And that's just above the camp now. We're just having a bit an aerial spin of the... The site, and then there's one-off houses dotted around the place as well. So people dr drive in and out to their towns, to their schools, and it's very. Uh, it's become even in the last twenty to thirty years, very more isolation in rural areas. So Ireland's a very agricultural country too. So like yeah, and they, a lot of farmers, a lot of agriculture, and they're part of this system as well too. That's you know that they suffer from as well too. So one of the, the key groups that we want to work with is farmers to support them, how they can get a fair living while also restoring the ecosystem too. And often in Ireland, it's, and it's probably in other places in the world too, it's farmers pitted against the environment. It's, it's you know, rather than seeing farmers being key to regenerating the land. Mm. So yeah, rather than having green deserts, we, we want to work with farmers across Ireland. And um, yeah. Sorry, pause again, let that go to go. Oh, sorry, I'm going to... Mm -hmm. There you go. So, so our mission, as Faye said, is to restore the ecosystems in the community of Ireland too. So again, we say like, we, we, when we say restoring Ireland's ecosystems, we include humans as a part of that. We say like, 
fundamentally the issues we face as a, as a global community stem from a delusion that humans are separate from nature we talk about humans and nature I go to nature I want to spend time in nature all these words are subtly and grossly separating us from from the natural world and from wider nature so when we say well yeah so we're, we aim to restore Ireland's ecosystems and communities and so how we do that is through regenerative cultures. So um, looking at decolonial thought, you know, as Conan mentioned, Ireland has a long history of colonisation and we still speak in, in, we speak the language of the coloniser. And, and I mean, that, that's OK, but we, we think and, you know, all that thing. So how can we how can we go back to, yeah, in the, the people of the land, indigenous? Um, in the, the, I think... The, what we're saying about the colonisation, like the industrial agricultural thing that's come, so a lot of our beef and our milk and our cheese is exported then to England, America, is still based in this colonial model. And I think that's what we're trying to challenge there through that regeneration and the, re- the regenerative cultures to reconnect people with their um, more native and hands-on and, like Garrett says, like connected with nature and part of nature. We're following a lot of the work at the moment too, again, Gabor Mate, if, if people have heard of him, but like trauma and trauma work and like how our trauma is as individual and collectively and we, we, we perpetrate that, continue to perpetrate that on each other and then on wider nature as well too. So how can we begin to break these cycles of trauma, of colon, like colonialism and that too? We've run a couple of courses on this. Um, one, like one this year online, non-violent communication and, and definitely more to build. We have really exciting plans for next year that we'll talk about at the end. The second pillar then is resilient and regenerative food systems because, yeah, people if people can't have their sustenance, if they're not being able, their meat's not net, met, then they don't have the luxury of, you know, looking after, you know, other things if their immediate needs aren't met. So looking at how can we, how can we work with farmers and, and land custodians and people to, to, to build resilient and regenerative food systems too, and taking a lot of inspiration from, yeah, from different people all over the world as well too. And as part of that, we've planted food. We've got three different food system models in the field. Four actually potentially with a pond, but we've got a, f- a forest garden, we've got an annual uh, market garden, and then we've got an agroforestry system as well too, and then mixing that with animals. And then, yeah, as I say, we're, we're putting in a pond, um, hopefully soon, which is a potential another opportunity. And then ecosystem restoration work. So again, very much leading on from the work that John and many people on this call will, will be involved in. How can we restore the ecosystems of Ireland? Again, we, we're, we don't see our work stopping just at the gate. The, 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 the ecosystem here that we're restoring is very important, but it's, it's such a small scale that we really see ourselves you know, we really want to link with other landowners across Ireland and support them to restore that, that ecosystem because none of us can do this by ourselves. How can we link in, connect with other people to to begin to do restoration work? And there's been some in the real in the, in the in the very recently there um, a social housing charity in Ireland have gotten in contact with us and they're they're proposing the idea that we'll that they want to put this at the heart of their work and they have housing estates all across Ireland and they're looking at us to how can we put in ecosystem restoration to so we're hoping to link in with them that we'll begin to begin to put in edible food systems and ecosystem restoration work in the middle of their estates across Ireland too so how can we these are all connect again they're not separate points that we're going to deal work with cultures and then we're going to look at food systems and then we're going to work with ecosystem restoration there's obviously deep connections between each of them So the, the land here, we're just going to talk about how we worked through the, this acre, or acre, and a, acre and a half on land here. In the bottom half of the screen, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the barn. Um, we're going to convert that in coming years. Um, but for now, we're using it as a tool, as a tool shed and as an alpaca um, space for them guys to overwinter. And then, um, yeah, to, just to do other work that we need to do sort of inside in cover area. Um, but initially when we came it was when we started it was sort of very degraded exploited so what we did first was to do nothing really just to let the land breathe and to do do what it needs to do it itself the first year the grass actually turned yellow from basically drug withdrawals that it hadn't been it had obviously you know it was just as it was 
detoxing itself. And you can see actually, um, and maybe two or three fields away, there's a brown field high up on a hill there. Um, I don't know if you can see Garrett's mouse. Um, that's been spread with basically effluent from these sheds that are next door as well. You can see the sheds next door that they have um, slatted sheds, so it's cows on top of big tanks, and they spend the winter there. And the poo falls into the big tank, and then it's spread on the land. And it's uh, has a tendency to run off as well because it doesn't all, um, yeah, the soil has been degraded and there's less carbon there for the, the nitrates. So that tends to run off as well into the, the water courses. And we have big problems in our lakes and rivers with nut- uh, nutrients and eutrophication and such like. But uh, yeah, this is these are the photographs of the start of the project. So the house, the house was the first thing to be tackled and it was gutted really. Um, you can also see there actually just on the behind the house in front of the barn is one of those slatted sheds that I was just talking about. So there's a tank there full of nutrient rich material. Um, it's liquid, or it's solidified now, but it, it's liquid when it's spread on the ground. Um, so that's still there. Um, initially, then the design was done. Do you want to talk a bit more about that, Gareth, and how it was a survey basically? Um, yeah, we've linked up with different people, like uh, some people might have heard Darren O'Doherty and Agrarian's platform in Australia. We, we did some work with, with Darren and, and then a, a land designer here as well, too, and began just basically framing out. So Darren has uh, the Agrarian's platform, which is taken from Pia Yeoman's work of like how you've designed up layout a farm from climate to you know, water to trees and that, too. So we began to put that in, in, in the process. Um, and it, it has tweaked and changed as we've gone along and started st- 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 finding its, its way now. Mm. Um, we've, we've, brought, we've had groups in, so again, what we really, what we see ourselves very much as is an education space too, so, and as a, as, a, as a community space. So we've had different European projects in different groups, and this, this project here specifically was one of the first ones we did, and it was, it's called What's on Our Plate, and it was a, people from all across Europe exploring um, their food and, and the food systems and permaculture. And so, again, the experiential part of the learning, bringing them onto the land to begin to restore it. So the, these photographs then are, what, 2019, October 2019, there's trees planted there in one of the areas. So the alpacas are, are there, I think, grazing on one side of the fence and the trees are on the other side. Um, so just to, to keep to manage the grass as well and to to start to yeah less intensive agriculture basically so there's less nutrients spread on the ground you can see as well under that big tree there's a bee box beehive so little little bits of biodiversity being brought back and yeah there's what January 2020 and um, just the, the state of the sheds as well before any work was done so it was an old farmyard that kind of had been run down and not really looked after properly. And yeah, it's all started to. So again, linking with animals too. So the animals we have on, on the, on the land at the moment, we have two alpacas and we're, we're vegetarians originally. So it was like looking at, like I'm looking for like what fit our context too. So size wise, we didn't really want to get into cattle or that too. So we were already thinking goats, but then goats are notoriously difficult to keep in. So alpacas were our our animal of choice too. So we still have Alan Paddy are their names. And um, they're and they're up on the land there. And so yeah, again, they're they one of the reasons originally is bringing in for, for grazing, for holistic management, and then um they're also supposedly good at keeping the fox away from chickens. So chickens then are our second. So we've got, um, yeah, we've, we've uh, chickens, 50 chickens now. And they're, they're the one thing that we're sort of selling at the moment, eggs. And um, yeah, so we, we, we moved them regularly to the alpacas and then the chickens and follow too. Um, yeah, the holistic grazing plan mm-hmm. now. Um, there you can see the figures that Gareth was speaking about. On, that was last summer. Uh, and Lily out doing some clearance as well. Um, we the pigs were we cleared an area for a market garden there you can see behind Lily there's a pig shelter so from where she is say back as far as the barn all that area now has been cleared off by the pigs in a rotating pattern they chewed up the air dug up the sod 
turned over, killed all the grass. Um, and then we came in behind with rakes and took all of those sods away and piled them up. So they're now rotting in another corner. Mm-hmm. But we have got clear sort of topsoil then to, to work with. And then It's interesting too. So from this process has been as much a learning for us as well too. So again, myself and Karen and not so much you come, but um, we're vegetarians and we're veg. So we didn't get the pigs with the idea of, of killing them at all. And um, we got them to work the land, linking with nature. And in, in the end, that is, we, we decided then to, to, we did uh, end up ha- getting them killed for food and that too. And uh, there was different reasons for that. And it was not a decision we came to lightly. And we took a lot of inspiration. I spent a bit of time previously with the Maasai tribe in Tanzania and how they, how they see their animals is very, um, yeah, to see it very spiritually too, and to treat it with a lot of reverence too, and then every part of the animal gets used. Um, but it's, it just brought up a lot of questions on, on certain conversations. We we had real hardcore um, yeah. uh, vegans, and on their side, we had hardcore meat eaters, and very dogmatic in their approach. And we were really just trying to explore, like, how do we, how do we, what's an ethical food system that regenerates the land and meets the needs? And we still don't have an answer to. But it's just it was really interesting for. Um, yeah, it just brought up a lot of interesting questions like, you know, what gives us the right to kill the pigs? But then which is more which is more environmentally friendly, pigs or avocados from Latin America that's possibly just slave trades and all sorts of issues too. So it's very complex and it really highlights like these there's no simple questions or our answers to and um, yeah. So yeah, other work obviously we're not outside digging all the time. There's websites and social media work to be done. We've had people around then making videos and we've done project work ourselves, making videos um, with two local towns to teach them how to grow vegetables just in, in veg- or in what do you call them, containers like raised beds. Um, so that was during COVID as well. So we delivered the beds to the houses. Then from here, we had the same beds at the front and we delivered videos to teach people how to manage the beds and what to do next year. And hopefully then they've got a good experience of just getting their hands dirty and engaging then with us through social media and through the videos. Um, yeah, another works then like planning, uh, the holistic context, the visioning, these kind of things that, yeah, in time, inside work that can happen when it's not so mm. not so nice outside. We, we So yeah, the first thing is like, so Shield Decree, it's a non-for-profit cooperative. So, um, so that that is one. It's the first thing we set it up to, to, to serve as a, as a mechanism for, for the work. And um, there's a couple of questions there. I see. So Rhonda asked about alpacas tolerating wet conditions. They're okay with the cold. The wet is what alpacas struggle with through too. So yeah, it's trying to you know we 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 have sheds. We bring them in if it's too wet, and then trying to give them. Um, yeah, covering it, you know, that the king thing. The rows of trees, like monoculture, Charles, and um, there was no trees on the spot, too, but everything around the, the perimeter is like Hawthorne, like a lot of that, which is generally a traditional hedge for, for things. But everything we've planted is very diversified. Like, you know, we're planting in, yeah, many different crops and that, too. So, absolutely, diversity is at the care, the care of what we're doing. Uh, cats asking about the positive influence on our neighbour farms. Not yet. I think it's a bit early. We we really want, and I think I think we will. Um, it's very, it's a very conservative farming background area too. So like, um, yeah, a lot of permacultures around the world talk about the benefits of not coming from an agricultural point of view. Born and raised in agricultural families, there's very dogmatic things. So, yeah. um, but we, you know, we, we definitely want to link in with them, and we've had we've had they've supported us, and, and I think the best way of like what we're trying to do is create systems or show systems that work. So rather than running sort of hypothetical things, that we're actually creating things that actually they can see and see the benefit from. And the, the neighbor's teleporter is a useful tool mm-hmm. now and again to move some heavy like big bales or big bags of compost. So he does come down and you know. Help us, help us out with that, and by building those kind of simple connections that he can see, I don't know, he can see trees over the next couple of years, or if there's a drought, maybe his land will be dry, and hopefully the land here will be lush and green. So, um, I think it's, yeah, it's difficult in ways because it is conservative, but also those little things, um, yeah, will make a difference. But actually, I've I've had a, an inquiry from a guy as well who wants me to go out and have a look at his farm, and yeah, just talk around doing different things, which is positive as well so I think that's in a different area like um, the other side of town as well so 
I think that yeah, but slowly but surely we will start to gain more um, traction, I suppose, in this work. There's new things like new policies at a European level coming in as well for like common agricultural policy, the Europe biodiversity strategy. So there will be more funding made available and even the climate action policy of the Irish government. You know, one of the biggest um, carbon contributors in Ireland is agriculture and um, they have a very strong lobby too but that's there's policies are starting to change I was actually at a walk this morning like an agroforestry farm like looking at yeah how we can start to put these systems at the heart of farming too and support farmers for their ecological work too and again breaking this narrative that it's you, farmers against nature um, yeah so you want to August um, yeah, that's just us setting out the beds now. Um, you can see kind of the, the lines being set out and as we're picking stones there, as Karen, you can see Karen doing. Um, but the next slide, actually, yeah, it shows then what we've, we've set out those rows. So when the pigs came and cleared the land, we collected the stones, raked the land reasonably level, then set out some mulch. And some mulch was straw and then other beds were cardboard mulch and then spread this mushroom compost to be imported from... There's a big mushroom industry in Monaghan here, where we are, and this is one of their byproducts or their waste products that we got reasonably cheap. Did we get it for free, or was it pay for? It? Forget. Yeah, we did for compost. We we paid for it, but it was limited, like it's yeah. just delivery. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the, 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 these beds then were left covered over the winter then and planted into then last springtime. Mm. Um, John there's asking about yeah the housing people. I think we can maybe talk about that and. Uh, Cooperative communities. You, maybe you can ask us more about that, John. It's not a hundred percent what you mean. And then Maggot talks about like the balance between feeding the world and regenerating our environment. But again, trying not to see it as how can we create systems that are that work with nature. Um, Gareth, we um, I think there are a few questions coming through in the chat. So, if you like, we can um, open them up at the okay. end if you want to cool. finish first. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's just, again, the, 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 again, we've got the three different systems that the idea will be able to run workshops into the future. Um, so vegetable growing, annual vegetable growing, and then we've got a food forest at the back and then an agroforestry. So that's, that was this last year. Engaging the community with sort of, um, that was a tree planting day we, yeah. and then we're building a pond currently. So we haven't been able to afford the, the pond liner. It's very f fast draining, free draining soil. So, and we've got the, when we were getting earthworks done last year, we got the pond dug out and the idea for biodiversity, for um, rainwater harvesting, and then be, it's at the highest point of the land that would be able to gravity feed it around it. But uh, at the moment we, we weren't able to afford, haven't been able to afford the, uh, it's not very clay soil. So um, yeah, we're going to get a geotextile liner is, is, the, is the whole clay based liner that we can use as a, as a pond, but um, that hasn't been possible yet. You met Seb Hoser. That'd be. I'd love to hear more about that, John. And um, again, could I could I just add then on go back to the pond for a moment? Yeah. I, yeah, what, go on. What I saw in um, Tamara in Portugal, they had a very porous um, soil, and it was really going to all all the water would go into the ground. And Sepp Holzer came and looked at it, and he said, all right, let's dig it out. And then they got clay, and they, they sifted this clay very, very well, and they brought in heavy machinery, and they put one after the other, um, one after the other uh, small layers and they rolled it with a very, very, you know, one of those, those giant machines that you fill the wheel up with water and it, and it just rolls around and, 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 and tamps it down until they got a pretty large, um, you know, like I, I guess it would be like, you know, probably, you know, like 20 centimeters or something. And um, when they got that done, the thing just filled up and it doesn't, it doesn't leak it out. And they, they've got now a series of ponds because they're on a hillside. So they put in several ponds and they, the ponds feed the other ponds now. So it's, 
and they've they've actually even brought back springs on the property in Portugal. So I, I would be a little careful with these these um, industrial fabrics and things that that uh, they're using because it's worth looking at a hmm? approach. It's worth looking at that other approach and, and doing that pond, to maybe doing this pond in, in clay. I, I would I would be Just very locally. I would be very careful with those those industrial things because what I've seen is that they're after about twenty years or something like that it's a real mess. And uh, can I jump in, John? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to suggest why don't we arrange a meetup and we can bounce these ideas back and forth, perhaps for the sake of the other people in the session. It'd be uh, yeah. nice to hear about the rest of your plans. <laughs> Thanks, Faye. Yeah, but I'd really definitely love to hear more about that, John. Um, yeah, so that, that's earlier to hear. This is planting our raspberry bushes. So we've got our summer variety and then autumn variety. So the idea then that, that, you, that we will have a succession of raspberries throughout the year. And then a, some cob nuts in our food forest. And then the alpaca is just chilling in the sunshine. So it's another section of the same video. Um, I think it shows the yeah, it's a drone, it's drone footage from a couple of weeks ago actually. You can see the tank again, it's covered over. It's from a different perspective though. So we are building an education centre that we'll get to. So this will be it here. Um, and this is going to be designed by a famous enough, kind of well-known Irish land designer, you know, like Mary Reynolds, and she does a lot of great work. So she's going to design like an ancient an alphabet. The old ancient Irish alphabet was the, uh, came from trees, like native Irish trees. So she's going to design a, an alphabet that's, that's, that's from the trees. And here's a meditative outdoor classroom and then an education space as well. Here on the left, you can see our, our vegetable garden. Um, on the right, you can't really see them because it's so high up, but we have planted like an agroforestry system tree. So there's a, they can, um, you know, we, we've planted them in trees following Stefan, Ste I can never say his last name, he's a Canadian, the permaculture orchard too, but planting in trees. So we've got a nitrogen fixing fruit tree, nut tree um, on the right side there. And then in, in, um, in alleyways then and then running the, or the alpacas and the chickens through that and then at the back of it here you can see that's where we're planting our food forest too so more and more like to putting it into a forest because they say again in Ireland it wants to be a forest and as long as we're fighting against it and um, it will you know we you know the most sustainable regenerative way is a forest because that's what the land wants to be so how can we begin to plant first. We're going to put a native forest at the bottom of here on the bottom on the right side, that's north. It's on a slope. We're going to be putting um, a lot of that back into just native trees as well. Yeah, I think that's a... Gives a good overview. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty much repeats itself from a different uh, angle. Uh, okay. I'm going to... So I'm going to just so stop that because I want to share it again because I'll share this one on YouTube because it's... Uh, yeah. 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 So this is a video we made it earlier or a work away a person who was staying with us made it for us. Um and it just it's a video that sort of just uh, tries to capture the essence of what we're trying to do here, the connection with each other, connection with with ourselves, with our community and wider nature as well. Um so I'll just play this oh, right there. That's it. Yeah, okay, just make sure can, the sound is visible, okay. Can you hear that fair? Can you hear it?
we dedicate this place to healing, transformation, regeneration and restoration. To the practice of compassion, we dedicate this place. To the development of wisdom, we dedicate this place. Though in the world outside there is strife, here may there be peace. Though in the world outside there is hate, here may there be love. Though in the world outside there is grief, here may there be joy. Not by words or by talking, not by hoping or wishing, but by our own efforts towards learning and expanding our hearts and minds, we dedicate this place. May our minds become open, may our hearts become full. May our communication with one another be open, honest and loving. For the happiness of all beings, for the benefit of all beings, with body, speech and mind, we dedicate this place. So I think that's that's the end of the the presentation side of things. Uh, Faye, over if you'd like to come in. Yeah, that was beautiful. That video is so touching. It really, um, yeah, it really shows your intention in the culture. I'm I'm the culture you're building. I'm going to share the video, the link to the video in the chat because I think um, it was a bit jumpy for me. And I'm definitely going to be watching it again later. Here it is in the chat. I think Jail who wants to watch it. Okay, so it'd be great to share some questions back and forth. Um, I, I have lots myself as well. Perhaps I can begin with um, a question to clarify your ecosystem restoration techniques. You mentioned um, food, if market garden, food, agroforestry, and a forest garden. And can you explain what the difference is between those three? Mm. And your so, idea behind again, choosing those three, actually, yeah. Yeah, well, again, so one of the things we want to do is have, like, livelihoods as well. So create, like, as a cooperative. So we wanted to be a space where people can um, can build livelihoods for, for themselves too, but, again, also meeting their needs too. So vegetables being annual vegetables and, and like, being the, the main crop that most people eat as well, um, but, but also then the issues that come with that too. So then... Um, so be going moving away from annuals to more perennials, and then again Ireland being like a, wanting to be a forest. So taking inspiration of this guy in the UK, Martin Crawford, who's quite well known for designing forest gardens and food forests. So like, how can we, you know, create systems that model nature? So again, ex so that's one of the reasons exploring the forest gardening, and then the agroforestry. We really want to work with farmers. Like so much land in Ireland is, is is agricultural land, and the farmers have such a lobby too. And they're also often put as as the the scourge of the environment, or again, it's pitting it against the environment. But they're locked up into the same shit system that everybody else is, and they're victims to the system as well too. So supporting them and working with them to show alternative ways are possible that are that, that not just benefit nature, benefit sequester carbon but actually can benefit them as well and uh, so having a, a system so it's again they're all small scale but it's like uh, with the education space that we're going to build that's the actual other thing we have a crowdfunder running now too so the thing I didn't mention in the presentation is that we, we we've been one of the reasons of buying this site all is education being key and our backgrounds are in transformative education so we want to build an education space and we applied for funding recently and we found out we've got it that, that will cover 75% of the build um, for it. So the build, we were, the tender was 130,000 to do the build. So we'll have an education space where we can bring groups to do this work, to support them, to learn about ecosystem restoration, to heal as well, being a key thing. And, in, and groups like farmers, so that they can see these systems impossible. So we have to come up with the other 25%. Um, and we have a crowdfunder operation. I'll put it into the chat if, if anyone would like to support it. It'd be well received. But, um, and share as well. Mm. Yeah, can support okay. by by giving support support by sharing is equally as appreciated. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. That's so I think to to as part of the education space, like to have those different elements for people to to see as well to demonstrate that you know agro agroforestry, silvopasture is possible. 
on a small scale as well as on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. And it's just as a demonstration. That's why it, there's so maybe three different um, elements or three different types of um, different systems packed into it. It's such a small site. It's really as that education uh, hub. And then obviously we, t- we hope to bring people to camp here, but to restore ecosystems, not just on this site, but beyond in different sites in the locality. It's similar to uh, is a camp control lines that we had last week. Uh, we had chip code with them and they had different sites around one area. So yeah, we see ourselves as, as expanding out onto different different land and working with landowners to bring these elements, but further out. That the reason the logo is a da- dandelion too and um, like at the blowing of the seeds, so the idea is like it's seen as a weed seed, but it's so much more benefit for for nature, for 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 all things. So like you know we're blowing the so like yeah, we see being a space here and the seeds then spreading across. And um, well, we see ourselves really focusing on Ireland, but then connecting in with networks like the ERC that then support that mycelium network to support. We'll 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 support around Ireland and link in with other people doing it all around the world and together we can begin to make a make the work. Yeah, yeah, and having those different uh, ways of producing food really open up so many different possibilities of inspiration and that demonstration. Exciting. Mm. I've, I've seen here that Majed also has written in the chat about finding a balance between feeding the world and regenerating our environment. I think that's that really resonates with exactly what you're tackling as you, you're taking these different types of food production. I'm going to, um, does anybody from the, the Zoom room have any questions? John also, perhaps? It's interesting, we're talking to John before he comes in there like, earlier in the week too, but, you know, the Irish is like, I don't know if there's many Americans here too, but like, you know, the what's called the Irish famine, but there was no never a famine in Ireland. It was like, it was a question of power structures, colonialism too, where there was lots of food in Ireland in 1846 and ever that, but actually it was like, lot, it was being held in, in, in by, held by certain people while other people starved. Um, so like really putting liberation, agric- liberation, education and like food sovereignty and all of this is the heart too. So like social justice as a key of what we do too. And, and learning from our, our, yeah, the history of our past. So that's, yeah, that, that we can here. not recreate the, the same patterns, which we are recreating the same patterns yeah. of oppression. Yeah, could you, um, can hear Lily singing in the background. <laughs> um yeah, can you you mentioned in your speech also that the the food, um, not the food, the beef, the milk being exported a lot to the UK and, and I think you said the US also. Um, can you explain yeah. a bit more how that uh, that model of colon, uh, colonial food model is continuing and um, what you mean yeah, by that? Ireland, um, we get we have we had a revolution, I suppose, in nineteen. 1916, 1920, so maybe a hundred years ago, actually, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting through this centenary celebrations as as we speak. Um, but yeah, we, we got a new government. We had to, I think the idea, there was a whole Gaelic revolution and there was kind of an indigenous revolution at this at that time. But then in order to get um, our own government and that kind of thing, we had to make some certain concessions to the British and the legal system and the money and that kind of thing was part of that. Uh, so you can have your own system of government as long as you follow these uh, other structures. Um, and the Department of Agriculture was one of those things that was kind of held in the hands of civil servants. And, you know, it was, uh, they, they replaced the government at the top of the civil service, the kind of permanent administration still maintained control over the agriculture in the country really and how things were managed so basically the big, if you look at the rail network in Ireland um, everything kind of centres on Dublin and so all of, all of the crops and beef and yeah it's everything, everything from carrots and sugar beet and any of our outputs were exported eastwards towards the country or towards the capital and towards the ports and that was kind of a lot of Irish people emigrated via those routes as well to England and to America but those, uh, those that system just continued in the formation of the new state, and that kind of that revolutionary spirit that was maybe there before the the treaty was signed for um, 
the new system of government or whatever that yeah that that old system of bringing agricultural crops and selling them for money it was kind of continued and then consolidated I guess um, yeah and now, like in systems, you've got people like, and it's the same again all over the world. It's of corporate control, and actually, you don't have necessarily nations colonialism, but you've got like certain individuals like that are worth billions. And there's like one particular person I'm thinking of, like you know, was known as the beef baron. Like so much, like where he gets to make so much money while farmers struggle to make any income too. And so, like you know, while it's not necessarily nation states occupying now, it's like these these trade structures that are. Um, yeah. colonial in their own right in their own way and it's just mm. again pass it forward yeah. so how can we begin to break them and create alternatives sorry John I interrupt you yes John and I see you Charles as well yeah no, I just wanted to say um, that I think in contemplating this question about about historical economics we have to recognize that this kind of economic system has massively degraded ecosystem function on a planetary scale. We have huge deserts that, you know, that have replaced magnificent forests and wetlands and, and grasslands and biodiversity everywhere around the planet. And the, the reasoning for this is flawed because the concept is that the, the things which are being made and bought and sold are somehow more valuable than the ecological function, but it's clearly not true. The ecological function is vastly more valuable than anything that human beings have ever made. And all of the things that human beings make end up in the trash heap. They're just useless. They're wasted. And, but those living systems, which are eternal and, and self-replicating, that's where the true value is. So I, I think we need to have this conversation repeatedly, continuously, until this is understood by everybody on the planet. Because as long as we leave in place these fundamental mistakes, then we're repeating history again and again and again as we destroy the earth. And, and we're now at the point where we have almost 8 billion people on the planet. It's not really possible to continue with this thing. And, you know, I, it's, it's, it's very difficult because... People seem to be able to imagine the end of human civilization before they're able to imagine a transition or a transformation of the economic system. It makes no sense whatsoever. And that's why we put really like but, the, the um, generative culture at the key as well. Like, you know, what do you call it? Trauma informed work, what do you call it? Spiritual work, but like greed, hatred, delusion, as taught as in Buddhism, do how we can begin to, you know, work on that level. It's not just about restoring ecosystems. I mean, it is a big part, but it's also about recreating that connection, breaking that, working with that trauma that sees humans as separate from. Yeah, it's very. In yeah, inspiring but powerful, I think, your approach because you're, well, you're literally planting seeds of hope, but you're um, also very, you're acknowledging the, the trauma that's there with it as one of your third pillars and through the, the conscious trauma work. And I think that's especially powerful in your approach that you're, because it does come all hand in hand. Ecology comes with uh, culturally, socially, historically, but it's, it's all tangled together. Yeah. But um, I think Charles had something to say, and also Majed, I also see your hand raised as well. So Charles? Uh, yeah, in the U.S. has been a history of uh, industrial agriculture. Um, it's still predominant with all the pesticides and fertilizers and deep plowing and all the things that ruin the soil. And so there's a lot of farms that have been abandoned because when you do that, um, and they don't use cover cropping enough, when you do that, of course, the soils become depleted 
And I'm wondering, uh, in your case, um, Colin, uh, are you, what, what do you find? Have you done any soil studies at all? Or um, have, you, have you any measures of carbon sequestration uh, before and after the restoration? We don't actually know. We've, we've done a, ba- a basic soil test, um, soil in the Rundies test um, this year just where the soil was regenerated, where we put the we put the pigs and then subsequently we put the mulch and the compost on top and then covered it for the winter. And as the, the crops were growing this spring, this summer, we put a, a, a pair of cotton underpants in the ground. And that, that's actually a national project um, to do with the National Organic Training Centre here in Ireland. And they've got a range of different... Um, I suppose underpants back in, and uh, I think, but ours was just basically the band was all that was left, the piece that was left above the, the soil. Everything else, there had been a huge uptake in microbes or um, soil activity. Um, so already, like it's gone in two years to being fairly active in that section, but we've got no baseline. I don't think. Well, we did. We did a we did a soil test at the beginning of year one. So, to, but and it's absolutely Charles, something we want to do is documenting it along the way. Um, and actually, again, I was at a, a trying to connect with the Chagas is the and the agro the forestry system and like how we can get people and I know you're seeing this but like how we can document it too but again we're only two years into this too so it's probably again too early even really to be but definitely we have our the, the soil syrup sorry from the first year and definitely want to look at and document it as long as we as we go along it's a capacity there were, to- there were toxins in the soil you said there were toxins no, toxins. no. no there's not Oh, I thought you originally said there were, there were toxins in the soil from uh, from the field. no fertilizers. Is it a turned yellow to grass? Yeah. Like that was just withdrawal from like not, yeah nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, potash. It's fertilizers. Right, right. John, your your signal come in there. Okay. Just, just, just just one thing. Get yourself some very large jars, and every year at exactly the same time, fill one jar with with your soil and label it carefully and put it on a shelf. And over time, you will have a record that will show everything that's happened, whether you have done a baseline study or not. So this is, this is one of the most famous um, research labs in the world has, has done this and they are because they started in 1850s, it's it's just fantastic. You should definitely do that. Everybody, how, how, deep down, how much would you come down? How, how much would you take off or come in, take out? I mean, get as much as you can. I, I you know, like a gallon or I don't know, so, you know, some amount that so you can do the testing repeatedly. And what's interesting about these tests later on. Those samples show everything. So like if you take pre-Chernobyl soils and then post-Chernobyl soils, so you actually see the, the irradiated moment and you see the depletion um, over time. It's very interesting. So, you know, and, and just putting it away on a shelf if you don't have the money to, or, the, or the equipment or the, but you get a, you get a, a couple of graduate students and a and a postdoc or a, a professor in the local university, and you're going to be able to have everything from this information. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of really cool low-fi ways to collect data, and we actually um, will be soon working with a new coordinator to help to help camps with collecting these data and sharing the different techniques to make it as accessible as possible. Yeah. I see Majid also has his hand raised. Is that how you pronounce your name, Majid? Ma- yeah, Majid, Majid, it's okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for this wonderful work. Uh, I, I would like to share with all, and sp- especially with John, about uh, we are trying, now most of us, we know the best practices and we agree on how to re- regenerate. And uh, okay. uh, my, my main issue here that 
uh, we are in the UN decade and we should. We have COP27, uh, 26 now in UK and uh, next year we will be uh, honored to host the uh, COP27 in Egypt. And I'm, I really, for me, it's a, a nightmare to see all this uh, big uh, industrial agriculture on the desert that already our, our delta and the, the inner land already destroyed since uh, the, the high dam didn't allow the mud and flesh. so it's not regenerated like on the past and right now we have the new lands and now we are destroying also our our, our new lands with this uh, bad practices uh, so i don't know really what to do and uh, we need uh, more uh, i don't know i need more help more advice to, to whom to to talk we are on the ground individually we are working and then we found those people entering in in, in like in my city like nueva or in wahat or different other places they are destroying what we wanted to put on the mind of the people and how to educate the people the communities about the importance of regenerating the, the, the soil so if anyone can help me it would be great and through the un maybe we can uh, raise the uh, collective request I don't know the solution to divide this big uh, industrial to be uh, more cooperative and the more small scale farmers uh, this is I don't know thank you um, I didn't catch the, the penultimate sentence help you with what Mayed? I said how we can uh, uh, use the UN decade ecosystem restoration to make more uh, uh, pressure or something or more awareness, I don't know, to uh, instead of having this big uh, industrial agriculture to divide this uh, big pieces of land into small uh, uh, farms, uh, small scale farms, especially on the desert, uh, that the new land, etc. I don't know how to reach that and to have more cooperative. I see the example of Israel, for example, they, it's uh, similar to here, but they succeed to uh, to plant and to make the desert. They have very good yeah. taxes, etc. Et Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that important question. Maybe we can invite, um, if anybody has ideas and would like to continue discussing that, along with my head, happy to coordinate conversations together so you could share your emails or contact details perhaps in the chat and I also see that Martin um, has shared some ideas on um, uh, data collection for for you guys Gareth and Conan so um, perhaps also there's a conversation there for you guys to connect up Martin welcome to share your contact details if you want to continue these conversations it's great to, for us to, to come together and tackle these questions um, there's another question here from Katrina saying, is it in, so this comes back to the question we had about um, the colonial, the, the continuation of the colonial food system. And Katrina asks, is it in Ireland that this way of farming was mainstream before the Industrial Revolution? And that these are more forgotten methods of farming more than new methods. Katrina, could you perhaps clarify your question? Are you still here? Yes. I am. <laughs> Sorry, I am. I'm eating dinner. Um, <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, um, I work for Mustard Seed Trust and we support uh, ecosystem restoration camps. So what I often get uh, see coming back from some of our historical research and often other research is that this is all, particularly amongst indigenous communities, that this this new way of this new way of farming, this regenerative way of farming, isn't is is what we always used to do before big ag came and ruined it all and industrialized everything. So I'm wondering if that, now that's obvious in in, in the continents of Africa and and um, and uh, Latin America, and I'm wondering if that was also the case in Ireland, whether we were more in tune with nature before we, um, yeah, before the revolution. We've got, a, we've got sort of a historical connection with the, the beef uh, industry, but the cattle, like a lot of our ancient tales, like Tom Bokunia or like our 
similar to the Greeks, how the Iliads or whatever, Ireland has this ancient um, tradition of storytelling and stuff. And a lot of our, um, how we measured our wealth in previous generations, and I'm talking bef- before Christ type time, like 10,000 years ago, was through cattle, the amount of cattle that a family had. And yeah, this kind of way of farming has kind of been evolved but now we've we've cleared all the forests, but we still have that historical or that um, I don't want the word for that visceral or that connection with our cattle and with our how we farm our cattle. So the farmers who do have cattle and have this big beef industry, they use this um, connection with the the, cow, the the sacred connection with the cow basically to kind of drive this. Um, what's the word for it? Narrative, I suppose, of the environmentalists trying to come and take our cattle from us, I, I think. And that, yeah, we've got, you want to say something mm-hmm. about it as well? Yeah, it was just more like the, when the industrial ag of the chemical ag, like that's more like, say, 50s and 60s too. And like, so that's real living memory. There's a, a friend, of the, one of the women who's involved in Chittagree, she talks about her, step, her father-in-law was nearly the poster boy for industrial ag, about tearing down hedgerows and, and coming in. So that level of like, in, intensive agriculture is only like, living memory and mm. um, so there is still a memory of sort of old more fishlings but then in ireland then sorry in the last couple of hundred years what happened was that you had yeah p- plantations so landlords coming in and kicking local people off the land so then they were forced to live on very marginalized land so I had to grow you know potatoes and all this in very intensive ways like not chemically intensive but in small it's things that we grow in 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 Basically, we're, we're not much else would be because they've been kicked off the land from by yeah by landlords and that too. So that's going back like you know over a couple of hundred years there. And so, mm. Um, mm. yeah, yeah. I think the industrialism and the industrial agriculture we had we had small fields maybe and we farmed cattle um, and then we we did export them. But that has kind of evolved or yeah. Industrial agriculture has come in and said, "Yeah, clear these fields, clear these hedge hedges, because we had smaller crop or smaller plots." And now we have, as you can see in the or you saw in the presentation, much much larger fields, which yeah facilitate big tanks to come in and spread this story, and yeah, just large herds mm-hmm. to to graze. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Is there a follow up? She's got a mouthful again. Mm. <laughs> well, Perhaps, um, I was going to ask. Katrina, if I could just speak to your question for a moment. Sorry, did you ask a question? Just to see yeah. if, if my question or our answer, sorry, our answer. Yeah, no, it was pre-50, so I'm, so I'm wondering... Yeah, we, we are talking about a new way of farming, but is it, yeah, it's, uh, I, I suppose you've sort of answered my question. You, it, we can't compare it to anything, can we? Because this is just such, is this, this is just mass farming. It's like nothing we ever did before, is it? So. Well, I agree with you, though, Katrina. Like, it's not, none of this is new. Regenerative, uh, like, agriculture, it's not new. It's just, no. it's come back. Like, it's come back a bit of time, like, they talk about the Chaga people in Tanzania, northern Tanzania have done what's called permaculture yeah. for a thousand years. Yes. So, you know, it's not new. And again, and then, I mean, there was a thing on recently I read about, like, indigenous leaders reading, you know, about, like, talking about, like, yeah, even, like, sort of, yeah, they, you know, we need to decolonialize permaculture, you know, patting as something new or a young know, new one is not new, it's it's old medicine. But John, you were going to come in there and say something, so. Yeah, I, I would just, I would just mention that agriculture is, is a bit about commodifying things and buying and selling things. And of course, it's about food, but I mean, something's gotten lost here because the industrial agriculture systems have tremendous amounts of food waste. So they're not really, they're not really working from the point of view of food. They're working for cash flow. So instead of nutrient cycling, they're cycling 
fiat currencies. And it's going to some people, but it's not going to other people. And this is, this is different than understanding the value in ecological systems. So if we understand that the ecological systems actually have value, then our currencies and our economy need to e express the actual value. And the, the value is of the commodities cannot be as high as the value of the system itself. It's impossible. So, you know, we, we need to get to a, a very high level that goes beyond uh, just our agricultural techniques. We need to understand how nature functions and to value how nature functions. And then we have to understand that functional ecosystems are always more productive than, than degraded ones. So if we restore the ecological systems, not only will we have self-replicating living systems, we'll have much more productive systems. Yes, and, and I think that's the element that does make it new now. So while the techniques have been around for a while, these techniques now operating in the current economic system and the current global system, which is in transition, it seems, that is the, the new element. And I'm curious what your conversations are like with, I mean, this is a maybe a Tough question, <laughs> Gareth and Conan, but um, what's your understanding of, well, what's your relationship with the farmers around you? Because there are different reasons that make the transition challenging for farmers and um, operating within the current economic model is, can be a challenge for them. Um, so what have you seen in your own experience and either in events that you've had or conversations you've had with farmers or your understanding of the the context in Ireland? Just, I had a conversation with a farmer this morning um, on, on the way to town. I, uh, yeah, she knows I'm doing this work and I sent her a, a link to a podcast about agroforestry and about how the, the benefits of, um, but it's basically having trees on pasture is good for animal welfare. And yeah, I think she saw maybe 10 or 20 years ago when she was being forced, or not forced, but like advised, I suppose, to take hedges out and to build slatted sheds and, and do these kind of modernization techniques. She, she said it, was, it wasn't common sense because she knew in her own self that cows are happier browsing through ash trees and stuff. Like they have, um, they're able to medicate themselves and they're able to look after their own, regulate their own temperatures and, you know, seek shelter when they need it or go and find water when they need it or whatever. So she kind of saw it 20 years ago that the, the systems were being directed in the wrong way, um, but still had to do some of it in order to satisfy certain conditions for funding grants like, um, what do you call them? The cap, cap, cap funding, uh, common agricultural policy funding. So, I think farmers were ill-advised and sort of directed into these newfangled um, avenues and have, she, she kind of didn't hugely invest in these things. Um, but other farmers, like the neighbour here has, has a massive herd and massive machinery now. And uh, she did some, but didn't do everything. So I think maybe she's already ahead of the curve by not having jumped in the previous curve. If that makes sense. Hmm. Um, I think it'll be a case of that. It'll be bit, bits of both. Like I was in a workshop, I was on a farm walk this morning and there was lots of people there that had a real interest in agroforestry. She's got two people. The first two people I talked to were younger guys. They've just inherited their family farm and they want to do things differently. They want to transition it away too. I also imagine like that person I mentioned, the, there's a the chairperson of Shield Decree Horse, father-in-law, since the poster boy of, 
he was the poster boy of um, industrial ag, this whole changing and up, taking out all the trees and that too. And she says, there's nothing will happen while he's still alive. He's an older man now. But when he when the, when the next generation takes over, man, would be different too. But I also know my my cousins that look at me like um, that. What we're doing is quite strange too. We haven't really begin the process because we're a very new organisation. I suppose what we're doing now is we're creating our systems and we're great creating the education space, and then we will bring people in. So we haven't like it'll be more next year, not really when we have something to really engage with that we will be really yeah. working to connect with with the landowners more, and not necessarily won't necessarily. You know, we also we will be us facilitating, but we're bringing in maybe experts from around Ireland who who farm in different ways to support. So that's the great thing about being a cooperative that it's you know that we can we can bring in the expertise we're needed in that too. But so I think we'll definitely be met with skepticism, but also then you know on, on one side, but also met with a lot of enthusiasm on other sides too. Yeah, yeah, and well, through skepticism, we can also learn a lot and grow a lot too. I think. But it keeps us on our toes too that we don't have all yeah. the answers either. We don't claim yeah. to have all the answers. We're just, we're exploring it as well too. So. Yeah. Yeah, and your um, food hub plans are also really exciting on this track too because that's also really thinking about, um, well, about the sustainable business models around mm-hmm. around your transition with your land. But something, I'm just looking at the time. We normally finish at six. Um, I'm aware that people may have plans for the day depending or dinner plans depending what part of the planet you're on um perhaps we can invite a final question from charles and then if anybody wants to continue to stay we can also talk more about the food hub and any other discussions more informally going forward charles would you like to yeah uh the reason that you keep a uh, large Grazing animals on your lands is is so that their defecation that feces and urine uh can um uh, actually fertilize the soils and generally what happens uh, especially if you're dealing with something like cattle for example is that you rotate them every few days into a different paddock um, so that they don't ch- chew the grass down to to its roots and I know you you have a small grazing, grazing area for the uh, apalka but I'm wondering if you could use a similar type of you know do you, do you rotate them uh, use them in a similar fashion. Yeah, yeah, we do. We rotate them and the chickens as well too. Not like not. We're still like again learning. We're still developing systems and putting the infrastructure in. So not not in a way that um, Alan Savory would probably be. You know, he's not be, be happy just yet. But like, so we're moving them maybe weekly as opposed to daily now. Um, and that's just time and resources and, and different things that I'm supposed to. But yeah, but definitely move, try and yeah, move in that way and and um, yeah, so moving it that way. But we're not just there yet either. And you're finding the grasses benefit from this? Yeah, like it, there's it, it's very yeah. So like definitely having the alpacas running and the chickens after it too. And then there's a lot of basically it's grass, it's docks and it's thistles at the moment. And there's very little else too. So after the chickens run and they, they, they create sort of scarifies, now it's called, but like, so what we're thinking now would be great to do is we're hoping that the, the native seed bank will start to come back up, which it hasn't in other places yet. So maybe throwing in a bit of clover as well in the paths that, that the chickens have moved on to, to sort of like to get that diversity going within the seed too. Um, Thank you. But then that's the point that you're saying about documenting it too. So again, this is really one year we've done this so far. So really it'd be great to, to have that soil sample over the years to see what's going on at a, a more detailed level. I'm um, certainly far from an expert on holistic grazing so excuse me if this is an ignorant question but I was surprised to hear that you can uh, that the method works with just two alpacas can you share I, I'm, I know that many people here also are not experts on holistic grazing so maybe you can share that well share a little bit how that process works to anyone who's not familiar with holistic grazing and tell us a little bit about what you're learning from it yeah your, your learning journey? Well, probably it doesn't really work in, in with two alpacas really to, again, because we're doing ever smaller scale, but it essentially it's like modeling, you know, and I'm not an expert either. Yeah. You know, I've just read some stuff, but it's so again, 
and um, maybe there's someone else who might have heard that but it's like moving them regularly so that they eat the grass only to a certain point like I think six inches as opposed to too low and that supports the grass grows much quicker and sequesters much more carbon so it's much more like what would have happened in like the, the predators would have kept the, the buffaloes moving so that they wouldn't be in one area too long so they eat and they eat everything as opposed to eating just what they like and then the other what's called weeds grow stronger everything is at and it's, it's thing and there's more of a balance in nutrition so that's kind of very loosely holistic management and my understanding of it in terms of the alpacas too, yeah. So again, we, we should have more higher density, ideally moving in that too. The way we're doing it is that we have a paddock and then just find, trying to measure how much to eat per day and then just moving moving them so that they have Richard Perkins, who's quite a well-known regenerative farmer. We were on a course with him before and he, what he mentioned was try and have like sort of three days, work, have them in an area of three days paddock. So Two days is what they would have would have eaten, so they have a bit of room, and then just every day moving them, trying to how much to eat in one day, and moving that much to the defence that much eat per day, so that they, they have that bit of grass, and then moving it. So you're kind of moving it very slowly, but yeah, I think you know my understanding is the same as yours, Fader. Ideally, it would be you know higher stock rates. higher stock rates, and it's all that too. So yeah, we're not. We, I wouldn't claim that we're doing holistic management. It's just yeah, taking some inspiration from it. We'll see how tree, I tend to, you know, move tree sheep in small paddocks as well. So let's compare tree sheep to two alpacas and see how that works as well and how much, there's more experimentation going on. I think that's part of the journey as well and people's uh, ecosystem restoration journey is to not be stopped by trying to get it perfect, just by trying something, being, having the right intention and, and doing something that you know is in the right direction is better than doing nothing at all. And you'll definitely learn from getting it wrong. You know, you don't get experience without making some mistakes. So, yeah. Mm. And learning from each other, learning, well, learning from, uh, you I mentioned was, Richard Perkins and, and the other yeah, camps in the, the, experts. the camps in the network. Yeah. Learning by doing. I've just shared a, um, in the chat, in case anyone's interested in learning a bit more about holistic grazing. It's a nice little introduction from Alan Savory, who's the man that came up with the technique. And, uh, nice video. Yeah. Speaking of experimenting, would you be able to share a bit about your uh, food hub idea? And yeah. Yeah, so the food hub, again, we're non for profit, but again, we're working sort of not like in sort of um, in our organizations, just trying to, instead of being fund and driven, constantly always trying to like, we're trying how can we generate our own income that gives us like that we can support it too so the food hub as well is we want to work with farmers and, and land custodians to restore land but again supporting them to, to have regenerative income as well too and then taking the money away from the select few the, the you know the the the, the co corporations a more direct selling too so the idea of the food hub is that Again, it's the Open Food Network. It's it, we're linking in with an, another group of uh, cooperative in Ireland, the Open Food Network Ireland too. They they brought up this Open Food Network. So essentially, it's an online food, an online um, farmers market. So, we're, so so the idea of bringing local producers and local families or local consumers together too. So the idea for us would be that we'd be able to link with farmers to support them to restore their ecosystems, but then giving them a direct market to sell so they can get a fair price for the farm, the work that they're doing as well too. So connecting that too. That, that's what we're hoping to do. There's only so much hours in the day too. So um, we've not stopped it, but we've paused that for the moment um, just until, yeah, until we can get the reason. Like it's, it's there. There's a, there's a livelihood there for somebody and, um, but it's just, yeah, at the moment, it's just there's so much going on. We, we have a, a European project application in with, you know, Ecosystem Restoration Camp to sort of support us, how, how you're documenting that process. And then that might offer the resources to support support someone to do the work while we get it up and then become to generate it ourselves. But it's, it's okay. Connecting, giving, giving customers access to regenerative food, taking money away. Because again, my thesis in my, for my master's was looking at supermarkets. And for every, for every job a supermarket creates for a local, they say like they create, it happened to Tesco in, in my, in a town saying they're creating a hundred jobs. 
but they're costing 150 at minimum. Like, so for every one job to create, the cost one and a half to the local community. And then that has all sorts of knock on effects. And that's before you get into how the food is produced and all that, too. So the food hub is the idea of keeping the money in the local economy, supporting farmers and farmers to have a fair price, local economics, and then families um, to have regenerative, non toxic food for, for their families and communities. If that if that makes sense or if that's clear, Faith. If not, please ask. Yeah, I'm. Um, perhaps other people have questions from there. What I'm going to do now is um, close. Well, two things. I'm going to close the facilitated part of the session and just the from here take a back seat in a, a sort of an organic conversation from here. Um, but I would before I close. Uh, just like to remind everyone of the, the crowdfunder that Gareth has shared in the chat. It's um, one of the last links in the chat here. And um, just to thank everyone for coming and, and for your enthusiasm and curiosity. And let's, let's keep learning and experimenting with this important work. I um, Perhaps I'll, as I now hand over, perhaps Patricia, I see that you have a question Welcome to jump in. Anyone jump in and let's have a conversation. And a big thanks again, um, Gareth and Conan, and also Kath for, for doing all the technology and also John for taking the time. And thank you to you, Faye and Kat and John and ERC yeah. for creating us, creating the work and creating the platform. And then, yeah, so we really appreciate it. And it's great to be part of the network. And thanks for everyone for coming. <laughs> we do it together. <laughs> Inga might get her job back for next month now, Faye. <laughs> Patricia, did you want to talk? No, I was, uh, you know, I was just wondering why did you choose alpacas, uh, these animals that are from another uh, regions, uh, to to be there? I don't know because I also I'm also thinking about animals for my farm, maybe, and if they have some advantage. I see a lot of people now with alpacas uh, everywhere, but I don't know exactly why. It's not only because they are so cute, or because they they look nice. Or the, uh, what do you do with the alpacas, or how is this? The main reason originally was because, well, we were vegetarian, so we knew we didn't want like an animal that we were going to kill to eat. So we want, but we wanted a grazer, and so we were thinking, um, we we're thinking goats. Um, and then apparently goats are just like ridiculous to keep in they're just you just won't keep them in or escape artists and eat trees and eat trees and then do a lot of damage yeah. too so so I'm, my sister travel around Latin America so yeah and I know alpacas became yeah so that was that was I know sorry also we were getting chicken so like as well too and the, the alpacas are really very good at keeping the fox away from the chickens so the main reason originally was um, keeping yeah, the fox away from the chickens and grazing the land too. If it was now just a, if it was a productive farm and it was like, yeah, I would um, I would possibly get rid of them and maybe get something else too. But the interesting, no, most people here or not here, but in general, when they hear what we're doing, ecosystem restoration, permaculture, they're not that interested. Two alpacas, they're fascinated by. So there's a, there's a creator, like it creates a real, yeah, people are fascinated and really curious and interested by them too. So this, that's just another reason now too. Exactly. This was what I was thinking about me. Oh, this way, a good reason, no? because sometimes you are with the traditional farm animals, uh, it's not so interesting for people. Uh-huh, okay. Well, we have the wall as well, and I would I would love the idea of spinning it, and uh, and we give it to us a young lad that was did, did a permaculture course. So he was seventeen, and he said he wanted to spin wool, and so he wanted to buy the wool off us. And I says, no, you take it all, spin it, and then we can split the, the wool. Okay. And then a friend who knows a lot of it also said to me, uh, yeah, you're, you're you're ripping him off because uh, it's so much work to spin alpaca wool. It's really good quality, but really difficult. And in the end, he gave it back because it was. Yeah, it was too. And then Karen's mother works in textiles and she was running a workshop with it again. And again, they did so much and give it back. So we have four years worth of alpaca wool upstairs. Um, but uh, yeah, which is something we'd love to do.
Okay, and it's easy to get alpacas here in Europe. I think yes, because I, I've seen uh, several people uh, walking with alpacas some here in Austria, for example, as uh, as uh, pets. <laughs> but uh, was it difficult for you to get alpacas, or you? No, no. Like there's a there's a farm not too far away, and, and okay. that's where I bought them. They're they're castrated males too. So like when we got them, we were there were a couple of hundred euro for them. Whereas she was showing the field we went into, and there was like maybe ten male breeding ones, and she said there was none of them worth less than ten thousand euro. So like there's all because there's different things like just the wool and all that is depending on the color, increased price, and then the breeding and that too. But the two guys we have are they're lovely, but they're they're um. Yeah, mm-hmm. not sure well packers, let's say. They're... Very good. <laughs> and the way they uh, they eat the the grass is okay, but because I, I know certain animals damage more or, or cut uh, very short and maybe, uh, or is, is it okay as they do? Yeah, they, they tread, they tread, they, yeah, they're, not, they're not very heavy animals. I think sometimes actually heavy is good. Like I know one farmer, because he, he was had sheep a lot and he wanted to get cattle because he wanted stronger impact. And again, go back to the holistic management thing. Um, but these are more soft. But you know, and they, yeah, they're they're not heavy eaters. I knew John, you put in horses. We did get the loan of horses before. The problem with horses, they eat them much more as well, and we don't have that much space. So I think we run out of grass quite quickly if it was just horses. But again, it's that collectively we were a cousin had horses and didn't have needed needed grazing, and we needed a bit of grass. So he brought his horses for a short space of time, and they got a bit of grass, and then that. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your information. Thank you. What I'd like to know is um, how much rainwater you normally um, catch on your land and how uh, prone to flooding your uh, area is. Um, yeah, I think we did the calculation. Um, we, we got someone in and they calculated how much rainwater we could get off our roof and to, to feed the pond. Um, we've got the two just meter cubes of rainwater kind of stored by the side of the by the garage right now, but it's I think it's seven hundred and fifty mil per year. There's just lots of rain, but not lots of flooding because it's such a hilly landscape. The water tends to flow from here down, and actually we're based the water that lands here on this uh, land flows east to the Irish Sea, but the water that lands maybe half half a kilometre up the road actually flows west to the Atlantic. We're on that border of two catchments, so we're high up and water flows well in both directions away from where we are. So flooding is not an issue for us here, but yeah, definitely in low-lying lying areas, the, the water that goes from here um, will flow, I think, into Donegal Bay or the Shannon, but one of the, one of the bigger catchments in Ireland, and that area floods more regularly every year now um, it's the next system though definitely the rainwater harvesting yeah. we have once we get the ponding we do want, we're yeah trying to build it up and we, we're going to get it subsoil this year but we we're let down with that but definitely looking at how we can store more water in the land and then harvesting it off the, the barn the, by average rainfall multiplied by the size of it a friend multiplied we'd be able to capture 333,000 litres of water a year so we're kind of yeah that'll be the next stage how we can capture it store it and then gravity feed it around the property um, okay. but yeah next, that's the next that's the next big project like that's the next big system systematic uh, investment I suppose after the the barners are focused this year to get that education space up and running but the next sort of mission is the, the water systems okay we're happy to come we're happy to have you come and help if you'd like Mark okay thank you um, you said um, th- this is about the um, uh, water situation on your own land but if you you, you said you want to help uh, the farmers in the area um I would suggest to um, map out the watershed the watersheds mm. in the area that you are um, because when you have such an amount of uh, water, maybe your land is uh, okay, but I could imagine that uh, further on uh, throughout the the watershed there are s- more uh, problems ahead in the future. 
Yeah. And then also, like, because we're doing one of the projects we're working on at the moment is making a film looking at pollutions in two lakes in the region, too. And a lot of the problems, agriculture, and, you know, Conan mentioned the slurry that's spread in the field, that keeping the water, washing that into the, the streams and then bringing it down, too. So, yeah, no, absolutely. And working on all that, too. But because there's, there's such high rainfall and there's such a high stock rate of cattle in those sheds over the winter, creating lots of nitrogen-rich material to be spread on the land again, often the two, the, the equation is not balanced, if you know what I mean. There's, the water will land on that, uh, the, the freshly spread slurry and wash it into the sea, or wash it into the lakes and the rivers primarily. Um, and we're trying to make, yeah, we're trying to make a video. We are making a video trying to highlight the, the issues. But because the industrial agricultural lobby is so strong and has such a, an influence, I suppose, here over the media and people's, people like to buy cheap, cheap meat. People like to eat meat as well. And it's, it is kept cheap um, to people like that. And there's, there's a problem, a disconnect between actually naming the problem and even through making the video over this summer we found it very difficult for people to name the problem or for people who say, for example, swim in the lake or use the lake as an amenity, even still don't want to say what the problems are. Like the water quality is really bad, but people don't want to be seen to be challenging the, the, the system or whatever. So we have many challenges in that regard as well. So uh, it's something we're working on, but it's, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. Um, yeah, but we're, we're trying. The talk I was in today as well, too, looking, it was looking at agroforestry systems and it was a researcher who's been doing, had an agroforestry system for the last 30 years and showing that too and how, yeah, how like, even if there's excess nutrients spread on the farm to how trees and agroforestry systems can actually eat that up a lot before. So so again, it's it's, it's the same thing. It's these, the, the problems and the solutions, they're all interconnected. By planting more trees, we sequester more carbon, but we also deal with runoff too. And um, yeah, just have healthy, healthy ecosystems. And it's the oversimplification of that um, process. That the, there's a very simplified process there now, but they're not looking at the externalities like the bits of the runoff for the environmental damage. And then also the environmental solutions that are available. They just, they don't fit into that simplistic model and therefore are sort of disregarded or pushed to one side. And it's, yeah, something we're working on. Okay, but the, what strikes me is that uh, this is all about um, technicalities, um, yeah. and your video was uh, a lot about uh, things from the heart. Um, what I can see is that uh, when you can't get your finger on the problems, when, when people don't um, tell, don't show um, wh what they are uh, going through, it's very often um, the possibility or the problem to uh, talk about their fears. And um, if things are not going forward, then there's always a resistance for change. And this is most of the times a fear that people can't handle the, the problems that are facing towards them. So maybe that's an, a, um, a key item to uh, dive into further uh, if there's a taboo uh, if you can't talk about certain things then you can't solve the problem yeah yeah mm. thanks for that yeah it's, it's a way that we can maybe yeah host workshops to address fears but i think we're, we're um candace and climate cafes are, are starting this um a local organizations start, starting to do work about climate cafes and to bring people together to talk about climate change and to talk about environmental problems. I'm not sure these places even attract farmers, to be honest. And I think the people that we have around here, like we sp spoke about earlier, about that conservative mentality. And even if we're doing something different in Ireland, that the other four or five farmers around us are <laughs> meeting at field gates and speaking about us in ways that are like, look at your man over there. What is he doing? He's crazy. You know, and it's, they're reinforcing their own uh, prejudice, I suppose, with each other and trying to break one or two of those people out of their, that collective um, chat or that, that gossip, I suppose. And once, once you suppose you start 
breaking the dam or the, the water starts flowing a little bit, then more and more people will come. But um, yeah, like you say, it's that fear, I think, is fear of doing something different as well. So we're trying to set an example by doing something different, but often having, having one or two people more join us uh, will be a, a good catalyst to create more change. Um, Extinction Rebellion in general. you mentioned, though, about, yeah. yeah. Extinction Rebellion, Regenerative Cultures uh, people are your uh, natural partners. If you have a regenerative culture um, uh, group uh, in your neighborhood, contact them, I would suggest. Yeah. Could I I add something? I I think that uh, you should plan some really carefully uh, designed outreach. Um, I know that Irish music is really good and I think it would be really great to like plan a big organic food music thing where, where people could come over and, you know, just like, like tell them, just talk about the music and the food and then prepare your, your, your propaganda well to share the types of, of work that you're doing and, and explaining why. Because I think, you know, when, when really the, the situation as it continues to unfold our world is, is collapse now. The, the scenario doesn't look like, um, like this can play out for centuries more. You know, when, when we look back over centuries of history, that's one thing. But now if we look into the future, we can see predictable catastrophic outcomes. This is terrifying. So um, there's a lot of, you know, not just what you're talking about, this, this inherited trauma or ancient trauma, but there's also this, this anxiety situation. This is, I think, also where the Extinction Rebellion people are at this time. And lowering the, lowering the anxiety levels are really, really important at this time if we're going to have peace, because it goes, it, it, it starts to build up to some really collapsed scenarios. And, and if everybody's in a hyped up crazy state, it's very dangerous. So have the people come over, make these, make these festivals and, and make it fun so that people will enjoy themselves and, and have a good conversation and pray together a little bit because I think the time requires some prayer now too. Maybe you could uh, get in contact with um, uh, Green Pop in uh, South Africa. They are a completely different uh, climate and different landscape, of course, but they have, um, for a couple of years, organized um, festivals that um, could be an example, or you could derive some ideas from that. Uh, John has uh, got contact with uh, Misha Tiersdale. Um, so maybe that's uh, that's a possibility to uh, start your festivals. Yeah, they're also one of the ERC camps, and they shared a training for the other camps on how they organise the festival. Actually, so um, can share that with you if you find that interesting. Well, it's 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 available on the knowledge platform and also on the YouTube. But let me know if you can't find it. Happy to share the link. I think they've logged off though. They lost connection. Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe spread the link um, right away. Faye. Yeah. Have we lost them? Looks like it, but maybe they'll log in again in a moment. They could be lost connection. Cool. 
Well, Francois, I'm in Spain. Where are you? I'm in Belgium. Nice to hear your voice. Yes, likewise. Nice to know that you're back in Europe. Yes, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm. I saw I'm, that you are in, uh, in Valencia. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually working on uh, the restoration of the Albufera Lagoon. So if really? you hear people that are busy with the Albufera Lagoon, please uh, direct them towards me. Okay. Uh, Do you know Professor Mian Mian? Yes, I've met him uh, at the um, at the Weathermakers uh, Congress. Right. But uh, I indeed thought it might be a good connection, but I don't know if he knows a lot about the lagoon itself. Well, why don't you? I'm going to see him um, in a pretty soon. Why don't you send me uh, a, a couple of some information about it into my email, uh, John D. Liu at iCloud. Uh, sure, I'll do that. At iCloud, just make sure it's the iCloud one. Yeah, I'll do that, sure. No, and uh, let me know if you come by uh, the Netherlands or Belgium. Uh, I'll be there to welcome you. Yes, I think I, I have a wonderful uh, osteopath in, um, in Brussels, and I'm thinking about going there as I look at 70 and try to process what that means. Okay, let me know. Okay. Were they able to connect back or they're gone forever? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Ah, hey. great. We were just saying, just as your internet cut out, that um, Camp uh, Green Pop have actually shared a training for the other camps on uh, perhaps might have been before you joined um, but they shared a training on how to set up festivals mm. oh, yeah, I attended that training as well actually it was an ecosystem restoration camp yeah mm. festival um, what we want to do is because it, because it's a small scale area we've actually had some issues with our neighbor as well you know so it's like it's a small scale. we've it's 15 like so it's limited numbers we'll be able to have so but what we really want to do within the community, especially the area here is once next yeah, year. This is a training about how to create an ecosystem. But giving them basically a voucher to our courses, like the neighbours who support them to get involved. Because, um, yeah, so that, that's, but yeah, definitely looking at ways to connect with, with. I think uh, we've reached an organic end. Mm. Brilliant. <laughs> a few minutes to spare as well. And we'll be um, stopping the recording now.